Too many things here. Um, so we have with us today Eric A. Stanley, um, who is the associate is an associate professor of gender and women's studies at UC Berkeley. I realize that I have known Eric for quite a long time. Uh, I think we first worked together back in 2000, 2008 or 2009 on the Critical Resistance 10-Year Anthology, which was published by AK Press. Um, I used to be a, a worker owner at AK Press, which is a collectively owned anarchist publishing house. My comrade Suzanne, who is still a worker owner at AK Press, is here today. Um, and uh, I was fortunate and, and honestly honored to get to work with Eric on a second project while I was at AK, which is the, um, the critical anthology Captive Genders. Um, Captive Genders explored um, what I would call the kind of violent erasure of trans identity in the context of the prison industrial complex. It's a vital collection. It's one that has had an enduring impact on the way that we think about um, trans and queer identity, the way that we think about the prison industrial complex and its effects. Um, and I would encourage you to, to check that anthology out. I'm very excited that we're also getting to do an event for Eric's new book, Atmospheres of Violence. Um, Atmospheres of Violence, it explores, it's a, it's, a, it's a hard book. It is a hard book. It is an amazing, an incredibly meaningful book, but it is a hard book because what Atmospheres of Violence does is explore racialized and gendered violence at the intersection of inclusion and recognition. And where Eric ends up in this book, and I hope this is a part of the conversation we'll have today, is thinking through the question of what it means to be ungovernable and what it means to be ungovernable against the pressure and the threat of assimilation. Eric is joined today in conversation with Jamie Grace. Um, Jamie Grace is a Baltimore-based organizer, activist, and artist um, who I am incredibly honored to have speaking in the space today. Um, she's been a driving force behind a number of critical interventions and actions across the state of Maryland through her work with the Baltimore Trans Alliance and the Gender Museum. Today, she is the policy coordinator at Free State Justice. I think we're going to have an amazing conversation today, so please join me in welcoming them to the house. Hey, thanks everybody. Ooh, thanks everybody for being here. 
there. Um, so I think that I wanted to start off with what you said about it just being a hard book. Um, I don't think that we, I don't think that I can make you, Eric, list all the trigger warnings for this book, but I think that maybe we could start by discussing why, or just like, what is the content in the book that people should be wary slash aware of, and then why is it important that it's there? Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you, especially to you, Jamie Grace. Yes. Um, I know. I'm so excited to have this conversation. We, we started this conversation like a month and a half ago, maybe, oh, yeah. and it kept going and going, so I'm excited now that it gets to be in person. Um, and then a spe another special thank you to Red, um, to Red Emma's. And congratulations on this space. It's so important to have physical space in the world for radical organizing and reading and being together and studying all those other things. Um, it's I, I live in San Francisco and there's almost no, we were just talking about the downstairs, there's almost no space left. And so this is such a vital resource. So um, thank you to everyone that's put in the work to make this happen um, and to make this event happen. Okay, so shifting gears. Um, glasses are going to, this is my first uh, in-person event for the book and my glasses are going to be fogged. It's going to be a whole situation, uh, but here we are. Um, yes, yeah, so the book actually does um, start with this uh, part that I call reading with care, where I try to situate the multiple conversations, um, forms of violence that I address, forms of violence that I don't address, that I think that are not necessary, um, what that means um, within the context that we're currently living in, in and under. Um, and you know, part of that for me was um, expand, so, so it's called reading with care. So it's a like, trigger warning. It's like, how do we create the conditions of care that we can um, approach these subjects with as much precision and careful thinking that we can, while also always knowing that it's a fraught project, right? Um, so this book, I started it maybe like 15 years ago or something like that, writing it. Um, and you know, I talk a lot about this in the in, in the text itself. How uh, throughout the process and still today, I like hold a really tight kind of knot of ambivalence around the entire thing. Um, that being said, uh, you know, the question I keep returning to is what is gained and what is lost when we think specifically about forms of violence instead of just generalizing it and not paying attention to um, you know the, the specificity itself. And so that's why I think politically uh, it feels urgent to actually think through that together. Um, and this, of course, is in a long genealogy of people thinking about these questions, the kind of central, I would say the two central figures that I think with are Marshall B. Johnson and Franz Fanon, um, who are both different ways theorists of violence. And so they kind of, they're kind of my touch points that I keep going back and thinking with. Um, you know, that, all that being said, um, you know, I think reading it slowly, taking breaks, um, coming back and forth, you know, that's the way that I would, uh, you know, say that, that maybe we should approach the text. Um, and then another part of that is that if we're going to thinking, if we're going to think about reading with care, something that is important to me with all of my texts is that um, they become accessible to people um, in prisons and jails. So right now there's a number of uh, reading groups that are working with this text in prison. There's three of them. Um, so that's really exciting to me. And so all the, all my authors' problems, which are very small, <laughs> um, people that have written books on that, um, go to get people back, get people in jails and prisons books for free. And so there's kind of this um, really um, meaningful feedback loop for me um, where I'm working with study, study groups inside. Um, yeah, so that's a really important question. I think it's also a, a somewhat un unanswerable question, and so I hold it open instead of trying to hide it, right? And so, um, yeah, thank you for that. Sure. Starting off exactly where we need to start. Yeah, I think I just wanted to set the tone that this is not your summer, like, coffee table read. Like, it's not something you pick up and it's like, pretty pictures, um, but I think that particularly, like, the lens that I was coming to it with is like, how is somebody who's experienced, like, experiencing this violence firsthand, how, how do they benefit from reading about violence that they are regularly enduring? And I think that 
like one benefit that I saw was like not feeling alone in your experience, seeing your struggle as linked to the struggle of others. And then also there are certain parts where the response to the violence is better, you know, than the, the outcome of violence itself. Um, I think from there, you talked about like the phenomenon of like watching this violence and engaging yourself as the narrator of this um, in the third chapter, which is clocking, passing, or um, but I wanted to address like the epidemic of violence against black trans women and kind of how numb our media coverage of that phenomenon has become in, in that it's like a quantifying of, you know, this is the 35th black transgender woman who's died this year and like in in some ways this book is like, you know, trying to get a compendium of all of that violence in a similar way, but in other ways it's different because it doesn't just stop at this person and the number that they are, it talks about, you know, what brought them to that situation and how they left it. So I think that I just wanted to, like, maybe say, like, where's the, like, humanizing lens in that watching of violence occurring and how can we bring, like, more humanization to these phenomena of violence that we're watching happen. Yeah, I mean, I think that you, you know, it, it, the precision of your question kind of, to me, answers that because you, you, right, what happens is that people are kind of ground down into raw statistics and that's supposed to prove something or that's supposed to like move people into action. But one of the arguments that I made in the book is that statistics hide more than they actually reveal. Yes. And it's one of the ways that the ongoingness of the wretched settler state continues its violence, right? It's literally through statistics. Um, and you know, sometimes they can be used to make strong knowledge claims, and I understand that's kind of strategic tactical point. But nonetheless, like what does it mean for the liveliness and the fleshiness and the fullness of someone's life to be like condensed into a number, right? What what forms of you know arithmetic and violence um, are necessary to make that happen, right? And then we just kind of consume it, reproduce it, right? That's the kind of cycle, the, the numbness, I think, that you're speaking towards, is how that cycle just swirls back and forth and back and forth, and things get worse, right? So all this information, all this data is not actually producing the world that we need to survive. Um, and so what are other ways that we can think about this, right? Without kind of looking away or not acknowledging the reality of the forms of violence, um, so one of the ways that I think about is, you know, through a kind of hopefully a careful narrativiz narrativization of um, forms of harm, but also forms of li liveliness that persist nonetheless. Yeah. So that's really important to me, and I think that this is something that we're really connecting on. Like, you know, this book does well, perhaps too long in the space of death, but it is always coupled with forms of flourishing, forms of ungovernability, forms of liveliness that are so amazingly tremendous precisely because of the ongoingness of violence, right? It's like, I mean, it's, you know, the, what people are doing in this book, like the way that um, Dewana Johnson, who's a woman that I write about, who was attacked um, while in custody, and she fights back, and she goes on this media tour, and there's this really awful video of her being attacked online, but she actually wants, she goes on a bunch of local media stations, and she wants everyone to see it. So like, how do we sit with that contradiction where she wants everyone to see it, but it's this really awful video? Um, Right, and she like fights back against the Memphis police. Um, you know, and so there's like those moments. And oftentimes they're like, you know, smaller or quieter moments of resistance that might slip out of these kind of grand narratives of revolt. Um, but to me, those stitched together form the kind of brilliance of, of trans life that I also want to hold on to. And um, I mean, kind of related, so for people, don't know if you can talk about this idea. Yeah, we can talk about Let's bring it in. Yes. Um, particularly because of the, the Maya and Brittany story, but I think yeah. that the work that you're doing, so uh, do you want to introduce it? So sure, yes. Too. Well, well, I wanted to <laughs> respond to one thing that you said about statistics, because I just, and 
maybe a hot take, but statistics has origins in eugenic science, and um, like the idea that we need statistics for like our activist methodology. I think you know this book kind of goes beyond that, but moving past that, um, I brought some copies of my research because. We had like a little crack conversation, you and I. Um, I guess it was like earlier last month, basically just talking about like what our different work looks like, like what the landscape looks like in our cities. But I wrote the Baltimore Queer paper a couple of years ago to basically just explain like what the landscape here in Baltimore is like, particularly to like new queers in the city who don't understand the history of the Baltimore queer community, but then also to queer communities outside of Baltimore who maybe have like a surface level Marsha and Sylvia analysis of queer history where they don't necessarily think that there is more than that or that there's there is history that goes further back than that, or history that is independent, you know. So, like, in contrast to atmospheres of violence, I really wanted my read of my research to be, like, as accessible, pick up and put downable, like, chewable, digestible as possible. Um, just because I knew that I didn't have people's attention for that long um so you know there are these short vignettes that span from the 1930s to 2015 talking about just like different subjects not like in a in a loosely chronological order um but just kind of explaining what my view of the queer community is here uh, the basketball book for paper. Yes. 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 Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. 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 Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing resource. I learned so much from it, and so everyone should get it and read it. Um, you know, one of the things, and uh, you know, it, something that you said that really, really struck uh, me is the way that, like, in this, you know, uh, the, the nightmare of the United States uh, queer history is always imagined to take place in like you know New York or San yeah. Francisco or maybe in LA sometimes. Um, in the way that this paper um, radically reformulates those questions, right? And, um, something that I learned about that I did not know about was um, the Pepper Hill Club rate. So I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, I don't know. If, like I'll I'll loosely summarize in that. It was around the time of the Lavender Scare in DC and huge drives were being done on gay federal employees in DC. So DC was definitely not a safe space. So all of the queers from DC would come to Baltimore to this club to dance. And um, basically Baltimore City Police, it's like, it was, I guess like right where 83 is, like where Ida B's used to be, but that's like right by the Strip, you know, where like, you know, it's spicy over there, but also, <laughs> <laughs> but also the, the big Baltimore City headquarters is there. So, you know, it's hot for that reason as well. But they saw people being gay in there and they arrested everybody in the club, like every single person in the club, like hundreds of people. Um, but because they, because it's like, because they couldn't prove anything, basically everybody got off. But I really liked, um, I couldn't find the, the court transcript, but I could find like pieces of it and just like the way that everybody in the courtroom, like, you know, showed up for their court date just to make fun of the, the court proceedings was just like, it felt very Baltimore to me to be like accused of a crime and be like, yeah, no, you got nothing, like, get out of my like, <laughs> So I felt like, and I also feel like the the tradition of like, you know, being beaten down and then responding with like japes, like laughter, or just like kind of 
playing to an audience that isn't like the court audience, um, like playing to the, the audience of like the people. I think that that's like really inspiring to me and it helps me feel not scared in those moments to, to play like that. Um, but let me see if I can pull out the quote. But I think it's, I think it's just like, also a really great example of like how Baltimore is situated in this East Coast situation where we it's have like okay, so that's the end of the I'm sorry, we're in the middle of a book talk right now. What did I stop talking? I'm sorry, no, sorry. Oh, okay, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> but we may know why the we may never know why the patrons of the Pepper Hill Club responded with humor instead of retaliation. The Pepper Hill Club was torn down in the mid-60s to clear the ground of the Jones Falls Expressway. Um, that's my little summary. Ooh, my job. These things are not cutting it. Um, but I'm glad we learned something. What, why, what makes you bring it up? What makes me bring it up? Yes. Um, I mean, because this is another thing that we got to really nerd out on is our love for queer history, yes. right? And so, um, I mean, also, I'm, you know, like all of us in this room, we're teachers and learners, and so we're thinking about, like, what are the things that we don't know so that we can better understand the historical context that we're currently living under, yeah. right? And then thinking about that and how the club was closed um, as a part of, um, you know, uh, building freeways, right, and the kind of processes of quote unquote revitalization, which are always processes of gentrification and displacement. Um, <laughs> another thing I think a lot about, about like the, um, the, the, ne the kind of ever disappearing um, figure of the queer space, right? Where it's like, oh, that right. used to be that thing. That used yes. to be that thing. Like, what does that mean? It, I don't know. To me, at least, that feels like a deeply ghosted existence where you're constantly like, oh, that thing used to be that thing. Um, and so, you know, for you assembling all this history, but then also the kind of more contemporary stuff, you know, I, I, I like the, the historical part helped me in the more contemporary part. Right. And I think that that historical piece of, oh, this used to be that, I, well, one, I don't think that that's an experience that's essential to queers in Baltimore. I think that that's a very black experience in Baltimore as well. But I think that that experience of, oh, this used to be that, and therefore, like, in my mind, energetically, that's why this thing is happening here now. Um, I feel like I was having to explain those things in my mind when it was actually just like the fact and the reality of things. So I just wanted to put it all in a thing that I could give to people so that I wouldn't have to, you know, yeah. keep going old, old granny on everyone all the time. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, but what is, like, I mean, this is off the book, but, like, what, what are you, like, nostalgizing, like, where you're from, besides, like, everything? I know. Well, um, like I was saying before, I live in San Francisco, which is perhaps, it's among the most, like, destroyed cities by tech, um, and so when I walk out of my, so I've lived in the same apartment for many, many decades, and when I walk out, and pretty much everyone in the apartment, the apartment building has been there, we're like a sea of billionaires. Um, so when I like open the door, I feel like I'm under constant attack um, all the time. And so, and I, you know, I think that nostalgia can be tricky and politically dangerous and all those things. And so I have all those critiques as well. Um, but then nonetheless, I'm like, ah. <laughs> like, I mean, it's a, it's a trip. I talk, you know, it's a lot, lot of time in therapy talking about what does it mean to live in a constant state of, um, dislocation or something like that and yet I'm still there right because I don't know where it's like home so what do you do um I mean all that said it's interesting because then again this is the kind of um holding on to the like um structuring violence of something while also knowing the like kind of um beautiful unruliness of a place because all this rad stuff still happens everywhere that we are right even with um, the kind of constant disappearance of spaces and places of people. Um, and so like that, that kind of holding both those things methodologically and politically um, feels really important to me and it's the closest I can get to something like hope, which I'm not very good with. Um, but you know, that, that's the direction I can take it. Um, 
Yeah, so, you know, I think that, and that's, you know, something that I see in your paper as well, and something that I try to think about in the book, is like, um, you know, the last, the coda, which is the last little part of the book, um, is a critique of democracy and the question of ungovernability, um, because to me that kind of category, which is very loose and, I don't know, um, very open, uh, ungovernability, that is, um, allows and perhaps names those forms of assembly, of collective study that attempt to kind of hold that antagonism between past and present, between um, you know, utter obliteration and flourishing, all these kinds of um, slippages that have very material realities. So it's a long way to, you know, everything and nothing. So what I meant, yeah. I guess. I wanted to also just maybe just briefly address like theory as a subject or like the vehicle of this book. Um, I think that to me theory has like an inherent inaccessibility, but at the on the opposite side of the coin, I've also seen colonized people like vastly underestimated in their ability to under understand theory, like. Um, so I guess I just wanted to ask you, like, I guess in, in my mind, writing theory at least a little bit feels like writing to the institution, if not about the institution. Um, so I guess I just wanted to understand why that was the tone or the approach of the book outside of like the fact that you're a journalist and say professor. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, to me, everything is theory, right? Theory is just an attempt to describe the lives that we're living. Um, so that that's, I mean, I actually believe that, but then to the like kind of genre that I'm writing in, um, you know, people like Captive Genders looks really different than this, and Trapdoor looks really different than this, and the organizing work, I, you know, like we're all working in multiple like registers all the time. And for me, I mean, it's also interesting because the people that contact me and most, that so far that have contacted me the most about this book are people in high school and people in prison. And so that's a really interesting um, mm -hmm. collection of people, right? And they're in the study groups um, that are being organized in prison right now, um, you know, are writing really interesting responses and engaging with it. And I think that, unfortunately, there's been this conflation of like the, academy, the U.S. Academy and what counts as theory um, in the U.S. context, and that's a very U.S. specific thing. It's not a global context at all. Um, and so I don't think that writing like this or this this kind of writing or these kinds of citations are the only thing. I think it's just one of many, and I'm a very like let a thousand flowers bloom kind of person. And I also think. Like, I'm, I'm just trying to describe the indescribability of the world. And it takes a lot of different words and a lot of different metaphors, and people can do it way better than me. This is just my little, like, attempt. Um, and so, you know, people can get into it or get out of it or whatever feel, feels right for them. Um, you know, because I, you know, I read this paper and I see you theorizing history, movement history, um, forms of belonging, right? So, like, we're just doing things in a kind of different way. I think that's really bad. I think so. Because we need all these. We need all of them, and a whole lot more. Because the world is the world is a lot. <laughs> so, but yeah, definitely. Um, I guess when you initially reached out to me to mediate this conversation, I was really excited because. One of the big things that I'm working on in my job at Free State is uh, prison reform legislation that would basically make it so that people could be arrested in whatever gender facility would be safest for them. So in our initial conversation, a lot of it was revolving around that work and how this book is relevant to that work. Um, and I feel like, I guess I just wanted to share where that conversation landed of, you know, the, the takeaway of this book is not like systemic reform now, <laughs> like, but at the same time, like in our conversation, you recognize the need for that, especially as it was brought forward by community. 
Um, and we do have a responsibility to like make things better for people on the ground as we can. Um, but I guess like we don't want people to leave this book and especially this book talk feeling like any of that work is a lost cause. So where is again I'm just trying like where is the hope? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think that that work, right, so um, work, so those of us on the outside doing work in solidarity, like deep solidarity with people on the inside is so incredibly vital, right? So like the work that you're talking about was, um, is being led and demanded by people on the inside. Um, and so that's like, it, to me, that's exactly right. Um, you know, people in abolitionist circles call this different kinds of things, and some of people call it like not conformist reforms or whatever it is. Um, and I think, again, be, because of the way that the world is structured, we're like kind of living in a situation where oftentimes have like bad or worse choices. And so I'm always trying to go for the bad one, not the worst one. Yeah. Um, and that's, to me, that's the reality, right? Like this, the, the only safe place for trans people is not prison, right? Um, that being said, if a specific person's like, oh, this, this, this unit, this, um, pod, this whatever is actually like the better place for me, then I'm always going to find solidarity with them to end up there, right? On the way to trying to get them out, right? Um, and so then we're kind of caught up in, in, in those conversations, and that's very real work, work that needs to happen because people need to be moved like today, right? Hopefully on the way out. Um, and so then kind of within that, and this is something we talked a lot about, within that, um, kind of cosmology of thinking around prisons, reform, abolition. One of the things that is, we've talked about for lots of years and that has always been useful for me is like the thing that we're fighting for now is the thing that, is it gonna be the thing that we have to fight against in like five years? Like how do we yeah. decrease the state's capacity to you know exterminate communities versus building up its capacity to do that, right? So that's, and we don't always know in advance, right? The state, unfortunately, is generally really ahead of us, right? And its ability to kind of perceive our moves, I mean, it's, if, if ever we're in that, that historic moment we're in it right now. And so, um, you know, how do we get ahead of it or get beside it so that we can end it, right? And I think that your, the work that you're doing is a vital piece of that, right? Like um, trying to ensure people have the most access to safety in a very unsafe environment. That's right. really important. Right, because I think that for me, like, the takeaway of like why this violence is occurring isn't that like you know trans people of color are like these like hopeless subjects that have like just these circumstances thrust upon them it's like that because of the way that our identities function in society we have less agency to protect ourselves and I think that in my work it's about trying to give people more agency, especially through greater access to community. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yes. Um, I wanted to also bring in like what on the ground work you've been doing because I don't think that that's like as front and center in the book, but uh, to me, it provided like a really important framework in like why I was trusting you as a narrator going into this book. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I am, um, I like most of the room, been organizing for a long time in San Francisco, uh, the Bay Area at large. Um, I don't know, most recently and like, yeah, recently becomes a funny category, but like the last five or 10 years. Um, uh, the group that I primarily work with and myself have been organizing, um, you know, against evictions, but particularly around street sweeps. So there's those street sweeps called clear stickers that are free at the front. Um, and kind of tying together the very obvious to all of us in this room, but also incredibly hidden um, connections between hypergentrification, policing, and trans and queer life, right, specifically in San Francisco. Just one example of this is, um, we just did an action last week or something like that, but during Pride, right, the horrible um, thing called San Francisco Pride, um, which we also call the straight pride parade, but um, where um, all the cops and corporations. Yeah, no, I like that. It's a good yes, yes to the straight pride parade. Um, so, um, 
right? One of the things that they do, well, the kind of context of this is that um, for, so Pride's been, you know, 50 some years old. So for that entire time in San Francisco, people have been organizing to get the cops out of Pride and corporations as well, but primarily the cops. And then two years ago, there was this little concession because it was online, so they didn't really have to deal with this, that police couldn't march in uniforms. But this year was the first year that it was back in person. And um, the police boycotted Pride because if they're not in uniforms, they can't get paid and they only get paid for marching in Pride. Um, and so along with them, um, along with them, the firefighter, this is the important part, also joined the boycott. And of course, our um, horrible mayor, London Breed, and some other people joined the boycott. Um, and this goes back to that question of the state's ability to kind of reposition its language. And so they were saying that like um, LGBT officers were being discriminated against, and so they were like doing it as an anti-discrimination solidarity action. And of course, pride is horrible, and they made a backroom deal where like all of a sudden the cops were back and all the nonprofits were clapping. Um, there it was. But the kind of larger context of that is every year for Pride, they do massive street sweeps of the Tenderloin and Soma area to get ready for Pride, right? So what does it mean for DBW and the cops to be literally throwing people's houses, 10 houses away, which include all their belongings, include HIV medications, include mobility devices, include all kinds of things, um, away to make space for straight people to come celebrate Pride, right? That's the kind of contradictions of the neoliberal hellscape that we're always dealing with this. I always call San Francisco the neoliberal laboratory because whatever horrible things they figure out there. And so that's the kind of work that I've been doing. It's very small, not for nonprofits usually. It's just like, you know, trying to create these connections that that our historical legacy was sometimes you know, disappeared. And you know, I've done lots of prison stuff and other stuff as well. But that's that's the kind of stuff. And it's fun because we're not connected to any organization, so we can like just call on anybody. Um, yeah. So that's what I've been up to last week. Rabble rousing. <laughs> <laughs> Something. Yeah, I do. I do really appreciate that. I think like another thing. I guess I'm trying to like formulate how you achieve like this third chapter of clocking, where you're talking about like clocking as like being seen outside of the gender that you're presenting as but also connecting that to like surveillance culture but also connecting that to your role within the theory as a narrator um and i think that's definitely something that i think about a lot as well as just like surveillance culture and its bearing on trans culture um, and how that gaze, like gaze, it can be violent, like G-A-Z-E can be violent. And G-A-Y. <laughs> but I think, I guess it's like, that, we're not really formulating a way to escape that game, but I think that even in just talking about it and talking about those that is connected, I think does something to disassemble it. But I was wondering, like, if you could expound more on that as well. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for all these questions. I mean, you just go right there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's really, really great. Um, so, I mean, this question kind of builds off a lot of other work that most of us have been doing, and, and it's this kind of, um, I don't know, um, paradox between, uh, the paradox of representation itself, right? So representation is that which can bring you into the world, but then it's how you like, find meaning. You see, you see like the kind of traditional versions, like you see something that resembles you so that you can form an identification or something like that. Um, so that kind of structure, um, and we all know like the power of the image and the ways that visual culture produces the world does this represent it, right? It's this kind of constant feedback loop, so there's that. But at the same time, right, um, it's also that which can take you out of the world, right? If you get seen as something that somebody doesn't like, they're gonna attack you precisely because of that form of perception, right? Um, and so it's this kind of doubling or this not, right? And that's actually become intensified, as you're saying, um, right, as surveillance culture writ large. Um, intensifies um, in ways that like 20 years ago we couldn't have imagined.
question, right? There used to be this kind of, I talk about this maybe in that chapter, like there used to be this kind of generalized sense that people like didn't want surveillance, even like kind of right wing people were kind of like, I don't know about that. And now it's like everyone's, we're all surveilling ourselves and each other and doorbells and this and that all the time. Um, and so that's really, I think, changed. And the argument that I make is that it's changed our very percept, our very like practice of viewing, right? We like understand the world through a surveillance gaze and everyone's suspicious and everything is suspicious all the time. Um, you know, and so it's that kind of like friction, um, you know, that kind of, I don't know, th those kinds of knots. And then I think the other layer to this that I find fascinating but also scary is that, um, you know, instead of being like, oh, perhaps, you know, we don't need identification because we don't need states, we don't need borders. You know, there's this, there's this drive um, specifically in the Bay Area, like around the AI and stuff like that, to make like um, trans-specific um, forms of biometrics, right? And that seems um, incredibly scary to me. Um, and again, that, I think thinking back to Pride, that's done under the kind of mandate or under the kind of auspice of include, like diversity and inclusion, right? Um, you know, and so in in, in in a certain way, this ties back to or ties into the quote of the last chapter where I talk about um, many in our room, many in this room are friend, Miss Major, in the ways that um, a practice that was so essential to her was changing her IDs herself, which is something you used to be able to do if you had ever seen a little ID, you can spot all pictures and stuff like that. Um, so all those practices then get washed away because of the hyperfixation of the biometric drive that we're currently living under, and so. You know, again, it doesn't really have an answer, but it has a kind of questioning of that practice as as our form of liberation. So, uh, yeah, that not a representation. Right, and it's like, you know, in order to change your name legally, the state is concerned with, like, whether you are evading a crime by being trans, you know? And it's like, I think that to, I guess to cis people, those little things seem small or like a coincidence, but it, they don't look like a coincidence largely to me. And to, like, I think that I've internalized this value because of um, the, the last story in the queer paper is about Maya Hall, who was assassinated at the gates of Fort Meade, which is a federal facility that she turned on to accidentally, and this was in 2015, and the coverage about it was just like, definitely trying to like downplay the severity of the incident and like make light of it, um, where I think it has like, legitimate serious ramifications you know in that you know civilians of any kind can't enter federal facilities and i think that like to provide like another state specific example like chelsea manning also is like super huge on security culture in like a way that like i don't know i'm i'm not i'm not one of the computer trans girls i, I can't do all that <laughs> <laughs> like, I, yeah. I try my best, I use signal, but like I'm not I'm, I'm not a VPN girly, like I just can't do it. Um, that, that's the takeaway. <laughs> the night. Yeah, that's takeaway is I'm not a VPN girly, but <laughs> I think it's like I mean she's right to feel that way. Like is is the point that I'm making in that um I I don't know like how trans people can like biohack their way away from surveillance, but like my hope and dream is that we can. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, no, I, yes. I, I'm also not a computer person at all. Um, and I live in, in the belly of the beast. Um, yeah. um, and so, um, Yes, I mean the, the 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 story, the like horrific story of assassination that you um, talked about, the ways in which in the media, um, you know, she was produced precisely because of um, anti-blackness and anti-trans antagonism as kind of suspicious, yeah. right? Always suspicious, yeah. uh, kind of suspect and waiting. I think to me that's part of the kind of larger um, surveillance gaze that we're 
you know, but that's one of the one of its functions is to produce people as like um, perpetually a threat. Um, and I think that, that like what you're saying, that's what you just said, like that's in, so so central to that um, part of the story. And it, I mean, so the question around um, you know like specific forms of technology, right? I think that we have to radically undo and perhaps destroy the, the, the genre itself for it to actually offer some form of liberation. Otherwise, we're just kind of moving things around. I think that that's also you know what I'm hearing. Uh, and right, and that's because we have to disrupt or destroy that kind of surveillance gaze that produces people as suspects. And to, and to produce Maya as suspect for making a wrong turn onto the, the place where federal secrets are held. Like, that's right. the, the place is what is right. suspicious, you know, like the government is what's suspicious, and the activities that they're conducting there is what's suspicious, and they don't want people to find out about it. Um, but I guess that goes into like maybe like a larger perception of like transness like as a costume um, which I don't know like how or in what ways you touch on this in the book but I think that that as like a trivialization of what transness can do I think I, I, I'm not sure where I'm going with this point, but I think that, to me, like, obviously transness is, is more than a costume, and attempts to reduce it to such, like, are a form of violence in themselves, and, and go along with a lot of these stories of violence, I think is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's what, what you're saying, what I'm hearing, and that is, you know, of course that's one of the enduring logics of trans misogyny. Yeah. the way that it shows up in all these in all these different forms. So definitely in there. Were you gonna no. <laughs> no, yeah, no, but I probably just wanna um, do you wanna I I I I wanna this I haven't formed this question fully, but like it is a question in my mind and then we can open up the questions. But there is like a part in the clock chapter, which I'm referencing pretty much exclusively, but I guess it's talking about how different theorists like Fanon and Freud have theorized like the phallus as an idea and how that applies to our treatment of trans women. And I'm a big fan of like focusing trans misogyny in discussions of transphobia because I think that it illustrates the origin of transphobia a lot better than a lot of people realize. But I guess, and you also bring in like, I think that you use the example of like Hillary Clinton referring to black men as like super predators and how that hyper masculinizing gaze is applied to both black men and trans women when it's convenient to, I guess, can you connect all those pieces for me? Yeah, I can try. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I dabble with a little bit of psychoanalysis primarily because Franz Fanon was an analyst himself, and it's one of the ways that we can think about the interiority and the exteriority of the world. That being said, you know, we always know that's um, never ending colonial um, groundings, right? So, how do we hold all those things? Um, and so, I do a kind of a who knows if successful or not, like counter reading of Freud to think about how we can use that specifically to think about trans misogyny. Um, so, that's like where that goes. And just a little bit, so don't, don't be too scared by that. <laughs> anyway, that's interesting reading the book. Um, right, because Fanon. We love Freud. No, we don't. We don't. <laughs> uh, right, but I'm like, you know, it's kind of an exercise. I'm like, could we do it? I mean, a lot of people have done this. There's lots of people that work in like trans, trans specific and analysts themselves that are trans that think about these questions, right? And think about how to open up psychoanalysis. This is hilarious because I'm like not a psychoanalysis person, but again, I, I get there um, through Fanon. And so, um, particularly because I think that there's a kind of way to read um, actually Fanon's homophobia as a weird backwards interesting critique of trans misogyny so that's how i get there um 
so there's that part of it. Then yes, I think that your your the point that you're making about um, you know the hyper uh, I mean it's really the hypersexualization and desexualization of uh, particularly for black trans women, right? That's yeah. what you're talking about. Um, as again, um, one of the, the structuring functions of anti-black trans misogyny, and it's that doubling that I'm always interested in. Is like it's not just like people are hypersexualized. It's the way that people are hypersexualized and desexualized, right? It's that at the same time. Yeah, at the same time, and I think that oftentimes in the kind of more popular culture version, we think about like trans misogyny or whatever it is. We always think it's like one thing. And the danger, in the, or the real danger, I think, is the way that um, the kind of twinning forces that are always happening at the same time. Right. Is is that it's you know it's both things. Yeah. Yeah. I I could really like just go off on on those like two and three pages alone that you're like, <laughs> but I I do want to open up those questions for everybody. Thank you so much, y'all. What an amazing conversation. Can we give them a round of applause? This conversation in like sections of um, like the digital space, right? And I think through the last two years, um, I think like the new sort of like, hot word right now is, is radical and, and, and radicalization. And I'm wondering like what is our response on if if radical work can actually be done through these. Uh, these internet platforms that are sort of showing us already that um, that that the work um, is typically only at the convenience of leisure of others, and that the sort of um, misinformation, dehumanization of people is sort of like the driving force behind the algorithm. Do you think do you think radical work can actually be done through the internet? I don't even want to. I have such a say. <laughs> I feel like, yes, radical work is possible to find out about through the internet. I think like, when, like, when that space is your audience, I think that that's when the radical work stops. Like, when you're like, I'm a radical activist because of what I post on Instagram. It's like, no, you're not. You're absolutely not. And then also just like, I also think that there's, there's like a commodification of these radical activist values where people have like gold plated eight cap necklaces and it's like, <laughs> like, please, where like you, like, I would get it if we were giving those out like at the revolution for like everybody who smashed a cop car, you get it. Like, 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 like. But that's not how it works. It's like you get to self-deputize yourself as that and not do the work for it. And then also not be questioned whether you have done the work or not because that like saying that you smashed a cop car on the internet is definitely a no. Like don't do that. So it's like if you are doing that radical work, like know what's above board and know what's below board and and act that way in how you share it but i also like it's a tool like we we have to to some degree engage with it knowing that it's like where an audience is but like i think as as soon as you're like playing into the algorithm or playing into like whatever that platform itself is like i think that that's when things start getting lost into the the Sean White shadow zone. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I, I would I mean I think that for me tech I mean everything's technology, right? And it's technology, computer technology. And I think that um, you know the good things are that when it can expand to access, but I also think that it actually decreases access simultaneously and I think that we lose we lose the understanding of that as well. Um, 
for all kinds of reasons. And then also, you know, about you know, two company, three companies own pretty much the whole internet. Um, and so, you know, if your group hasn't multiple times had its entire platform taken down, then it's probably not doing what it should be doing. Um, and so, you know, that that's like the reality. I think every group I've been in has been banned on every platform. Um, and um, again, I think exactly what you're saying. It's so good at like getting. Or it can be really good at getting information out. Um, but I also, at the end of the day, I'm not sure if I like know about more stuff now than I did 20 years ago. So that's an interesting contradiction to sit with, like historically. Um, it's neither here nor there. Again, I think the good things are when it can expand access to people. Um, but we also always have to understand the ways that it's increasing access. And then the whole surveillance. I mean, that's a whole other story. But um, yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> I think it's, you know, again, I'm like, you know, I'm like, post something online, also make flyers, also be face, also send so right. like, do all the things at once instead of thinking one thing is going to end up like the best option. So just trying everything and see what sticks. And that's not, there's a good question over here. Here. Agreement. And I just wanted to add that the, the obvious benefit of online stuff is disability access. And I know you guys definitely know that, but for people who have problems getting out in the world for all the reasons they do, the internet is a way to at least start participation. Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, that the question of access is central to all of that. about how you were able to get this book into prisons and do reading groups when prisons like censor so much, especially when it comes to like, I think it's like Barnes and Noble or something is like the national um, way that people send books and I know I have and like, even like, I don't know, kids books on dragons and stuff are being censored in prisons. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So it's, um, as we know, like every prison is its own little fiefdom and every warden is yeah. its own monster. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it gets, it, you know, Captain Genders is banned in a lot, but then it gets in a lot. It really depends. Um, the people that have been sending this uh, in is No Names Book Club. Um, so they've been doing like the work of the LGBT books prisoners also. So they're the ones that actually send it in. And, you know, it, it, the same prison will like reject five copies of it. But every copy that goes in, they get circulated. Like people, you know, people that organize it, of course, they just share it like that. So you just kind of try to flood it and hope that that day the person's not really open. But also, like, Captain Gender's got more banned, I think, because there's no burning police car in the front. This one, it's like, it's, I mean, a lot of it, because when they're looking at it, they're just like, what? It's an interesting question of fear, too. They're like, I don't know what this looks like. Yeah. Um, and so it's because the book, you know, it's like just the peers. You know, because it's actually at that level, because people are just like generally like going through them like that. Um, the problem is when it gets on like a federal list, and then it becomes much harder if they're even looking. But yeah, that's been the experience so far. And it could get worse. I mean, it'll only get worse. Um, Other questions or things folks want to put into the conversation? Please one more. There we go. I I have so many questions. <laughs> I feel like there, there's so much there. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to see if maybe if you both could go back to the uh, to the question of theory. Um, what is the use of it? How is it produced? I'm uh, I'm from from Philly, and I am with a lot of like, homeless activists, and I feel like they're they're producing theories that like and I like want to follow their what this person is like performing. Um, but um, I'm just wondering, just thoughts on those those types of uh, interactions that you have, especially in the organizing space, especially. I guess, t 
to me like theory is really good at like unsettling deeply held ideas that we have just internalized from existing um particularly when it provides like examples that run counter to our experience and for me like when i was a gender women's studies scholar i feel like i did learn a lot about like my own positionality relative to others. So I think that theory is like very beneficial in that way. Uh, and I also think that theory can help people like explain really complicated ideas um, and make like create patterns where mm -hmm. it didn't seem like there was any. So I definitely see like strong benefits to theory, but like to, to me and part of the reason why I raised that question in the way that I did is like, I know like getting an activist that I know care about and agree with to read this piece of theory can be tough. Like, you know, like I need to understand like what the selling point is relative to them. And um, sometimes it's like people just don't have the, the bandwidth to engage with, with that or just like to be challenged in that way. But I think for the people who want to be challenged in that way, it's, it's, it's a really positive thing. Yeah, I think that that, the, um, did you call it like the denaturalizing or destabilizing effect of theory? And again, I think to me, like everything is theory. And I will say, I mean, I say that all the time when I teach, I say that because I actually really believe it. And I think it's, to me, it's also like, you know, abstract art or poetry, like all those things are forms of theorization that oftentimes we don't like understand as such. And people, you know, and we all kind of connect on the different things, right? This goes back to like, would you, would someone read that or not? Like, not everyone has to read everything that's fine. Right, yeah. Like this book, like you can use it to like prop open the door. You can, there's a lot of uses for it. <laughs> it's, that's fine, you know what I mean? And it's like, and I think the like long history of, of what con constitutes theory now, right? Like Banan is writing on the battlefields of Algeria, right? During the war for liberation. And now it's understood to be theory, right? But then just writing his like, his, actually his notes, right? His, um, his, his uh, plenty of notes. Um, while also trying to, you know, describe the crushing violence of colonialism and what it would take to overthrow, you know, the French colonial regime. And so that, you know, in, a in, in, in its time wasn't understood to be theory, but now it's kind of understood to be theory. And again, it's like moving in multiple registers, like what you're saying, the people that you're working with in solidarity with are creating theory too. And throughout the book, I try to like, you know, unfortunately there is a lot of times academic writing will do like the, the people are the examples and then use the theory to describe the people. Yeah. And I try to really push back on that and the people are creating their own theorization and sometimes people come in and talk to them and sometimes they don't, meaning like other, other theorists or whatever. Um, you know, and of course that's gonna fail in all kinds of ways. You know, this book does look like this. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think, again, it's useful in that, in, in, in as much as, as it might destabilize some of the things that are really sentimented in the world that we live in. Thank you. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, thank you all so much for coming out today. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. Thank you so much, Jamie Grace. Um, I'm so thrilled to have you here. Um, can we give them a round of applause? Um, and just a heads up for you all, we have more events coming up next week. Um, on Tuesday we have, uh, actually I'm just not going to even run down the whole list, so we have um, Christian Williams next week. Uh, actually on Tuesday we have H.R. Webster in conversation with Stephanie Barber, a um, really amazing event talking about the intersections of prison, abolition, and the arts. We have Christian Williams here, who is an anarchist theorist, um, the author of Our Enemies in Blue, among other books. Um, he's here to talk about his new book, Gang Politics. We have um, 
Uh, we have Anne Elizabeth Moore um, coming to talk about her new book, Gentrifier. Um, and we have Gio Marr um, coming to talk about his book, Anti-Colonial Eruptions. So there's a lot of exciting stuff in the next couple of weeks. Check it out at redmos.org um, or uh, sign up for our mailing list. And we hope to see you all back in here for some of those events. Thank you again for coming out. Have a great rest of your day.